Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, I'm uh, Tom Ball, and it's my pleasure uh, this early Thursday morning uh, to welcome the Dilligs, Ishel and Thomas Dillig, uh, from Stanford University, where they work as a power duo on program analysis with uh, Alex Aiken, and they're going to uh, describe to us some work on doing scalable, precise analysis in the presence of uncertainty and imprecision. Yeah. So welcome. Okay. We look forward to the talk. Thank you, Tom. So this talk is about constraint-based analysis in the presence of uncertainty and imprecision. And this is joint work with Tom, who will give the second half of this talk, and also our advisor, Alex Aiken. First of all, when we try to reason about programs statically, it would be great if we had perfect knowledge about the world. But unfortunately, uncertainty and imprecision come up all the time. First of all, uncertainty comes up because we cannot model every aspect of the environment that a program executes in. And similarly, imprecision comes up because any program verification technique is necessarily based on some sort of abstraction of the program. Now to convince you that uncertainty and imprecision really are recurring themes in program analysis, let's walk through a few simple but realistic examples. So one typical example of uncertainty is whenever we ask the user for some kind of input. So here we have a function that returns true if the user input is y, and otherwise it returns false. Here, since we have no control over what the user input is going to be, we have to assume that this function can non-deterministically either return true or false, but we don't know which one. Another situation where uncertainty might come up is whenever we receive data over the network. So for example, here I've opened some socket, and then I'm using the receive function to get data over the network and populate the contents of this one kilobyte buffer that I just allocated on the stack. Now after this call to receive, I have to assume that the contents of the buffer could be anything because I don't know what, I'm, what kind of data I'm receiving. So therefore, for example, among other things, it could mean that the cast on the next line could be unsafe. A third situation where uncertainty comes up might be when something depends on operating system state. So for example, since we don't typically reason about the free list of the operating system, then we have to assume that malloc can non-deterministically either return null or non-null. And we could think of many more situations where uncertainty plays a role. For example, calling a function for which we don't have the source code. Or when the, thread, when the scheduler gets to make a decision about which thread is to run next, and so on. So therefore, in all of these situations, there are certain values that appear as non-deterministic choices made by the environment. Now moving on to imprecision, at first glance imprecision seems quite different from uncertainty because imprecision arises from the abstraction that's chosen intentionally by the analysis designer. However, as we'll see in the next couple of examples, imprecision will have very similar consequences as uncertainty. For instance, if my program analysis doesn't integrate sophisticated shape analysis reasoning, then it will most likely end up smashing all elements of an unbounded data structure or an abstract data type into a single summary node. And if that's the case, and I read a particular element out of this array, then I have to assume that this array read could result any one of the possible values that I previously wrote to this array. Another source of imprecision could be due to not tracking complicated arithmetic. 
for instance, for the sake of scalability. So, for example, if my analysis doesn't reason about nonlinear arithmetic, then it will have no idea what this expression coefficient times a times b plus min size is going to evaluate to. And so therefore, this expression will again look to my analysis as though it was a non-deterministic environment choice. Yet a third source of imprecision could be, for example, not knowing about complicated loop invariants. So here we have a compute GCD function that uses Euclid's algorithm for computing the greatest common divisor of two elements, A and B. So here, unless my analysis somehow knows about some non-trivial number theoretic axioms, then it will most likely have no clue what's going on inside compute GCD. And therefore, again, the result of calling compute GCD will have to be treated as a non-deterministic environment choice. So therefore, to recap, in all of these situations, sources of imprecision appear to my analysis as non-deterministic environment choices, even though there is no true non-determinism anywhere here. Now, to deal with these problems that arise from uncertainty and imprecision, many sound program analysis systems, and in particular constraint-based systems, will typically model environment choice by introducing fresh, unconstrained variables. And in this talk, we're going to refer to such variables as choice variables. So to be more concrete, for instance, whenever there's a call to a function like get user input, we're just going to make up some fresh variable beta. And then if someone asks, is it possible that beta is equal to the character y? Well, the answer is, of course, I don't know what the user input is. Yes, we'll get to the more specific part like a little bit later. Yeah. Similarly, if someone asks, is it possible that beta is some value other than the character y? Well, again, the answer is of course, because beta is an unconstrained variable. On the other hand, if someone asks, can we guarantee that beta is equal to the character y? Well, unsurprisingly, the answer is, of course, not. Now, while the introduction of these choice variables allows us to be sound in the presence of uncertainty and imprecision, the use of these choice variables will introduce two important classes of problems. First of all, on the theoretical side, whenever we have recursive constraints that contain choice variables, it's far from clear how we can go about solving them. And we'll see an example of this in just a second. Furthermore, on the practical side, the number of these choice variables grows proportionally in the size of the analyzed program. And therefore, this results in large formulas, which then directly translates into the poor scalability of the analysis. Now, to illustrate the theoretical problems that arise from these choice variables, let's look at this simple but recursive query user function. So what this function does is it takes a Boolean variable called feature enabled. If this particular feature is not enabled, it returns false. Then if it is enabled, it asks the user for some kind of input. Then if the user input is Y, it will return true. If the user input is n, it returns false. And if the user can't follow instructions and enter some invalid character, then it will invoke itself recursively to require the user for a valid input character. So suppose here we want to know when will the square user function return true. Or stating this a little bit differently, given some arbitrary argument alpha that denotes feature enabled, what can we say about the constraint pi alpha comma true under which query user will return true? Now let's try to write this constraint together. First of all, as we can see from this highlighted line, a prerequisite for this function to return true is that feature enabled must be true. 
Otherwise, the function returns false on the first line. So therefore, we have alpha equals true as part of this formula. So one way in which this function will return true is if, in addition to alpha being true, if the user input that we denote by the choice variable beta is equal to the character y on the first invocation of the function. But obviously, this isn't the only way this function will return true. It will also return true is if, in addition to alpha being true, if the user input beta is not equal to the character n on the first invocation, and in addition, the result of the recursive call is true. Here, note that we've applied the substitution true replaces alpha, because we know that if we were able to make the recursive call, then future enabled must have been true. Otherwise, we would have returned on the first line. And what is beta prime? Oh, I'll get to it in just a sec. Yeah, okay. Furthermore, note that, that we need a substitution that says beta prime, where beta prime is a fresh choice variable, replaces the old choice variable beta because there is a distinct user input on each distinct recursive invocation. Otherwise, in the general case, it would not be sound not to rename this choice variable. So actually, there's some simplification in the flow analysis, right? Because uh, feature enable just flew uh, exactly, directly, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So therefore, this constraint here characterizes the exact condition under which query user will return true. However, note that this constraint is recursive, which is not surprising given that query user is a recursive function. But for this constraint to be immediately useful to us so that we can issue satisfiability and validity queries and so on, we have to solve it and bring it to closed form. Now, if we try to solve this constraint naively using a standard fixed point computation, then we're going to end up introducing an unbounded number of choice variables, beta, beta prime, beta double prime, and so on. And obviously, this simple fixed point computation won't terminate. So therefore, the lesson to be learned from this example is that when we have recursive constraints that contain these choice variables, it's at least not immediately clear how you can go about solving them. But however, even if we did have some way of solving such recursive constraints, these choice variables still cause us headaches with scalability even for reasonably small programs. And to see why, let's consider this key new private function from OpenSSH. And even though this function may at first look a little bit scary, it's actually one of the smallest functions I could find in all of OpenSSH. So what this function does is it takes an integer that identifies the type of the cryptographic key we want to allocate. And then, depending on the type of the requested cryptographic key, it tries to initialize various fields. And if in doing so, if any of the memory allocations fail, it calls this exit function called fatal, which obviously aborts the program, and also logs that a memory allocator function called bn new failed. On the other hand, if all the memory allocations succeed, this function will return a properly initialized cryptographic key called k in this function. Now here, let's assume that key RSA1, key RSA, and key DSA were pound defined as 1, 2, and 3 respectively. So therefore, this is what the preprocessed source code will look like. So now suppose we're interested in knowing the constraint under which key new successful, key new private, will successfully return a new key. Or in other words, what's the constraint under which we will reach this line highlighted in red? So now, as before, let's denote the argument to key new private by alpha. And to make it easier on us to reason about this function, let's slice the relevant part of this function. And if we do that, this is what the slice will look like. Now, as I mentioned earlier, bnnu is a memory allocator. For instance, it could be a malloc wrapper. 
So therefore, as we've seen before, its return value should be treated as a non-deterministic environment choice. So therefore, unsurprisingly, we're going to replace each call to Bn nu with a fresh choice variable beta i. Now, if we do that, then we end up with this much simpler version of key nu private that's given on this slide. And if we stare at this for just a second and put all of this together, then we can write the condition under which the function succeeds as this constraint here that I won't even attempt to read. And to say the very least, this is a somewhat verbose way of stating that this function succeeds if all the memory allocations succeed. Now, if that wasn't convincing enough for you, now let's take a look at the calling context of this function. Now, in this three-line code snippet here, we're trying to allocate three different kinds of cryptographic keys, one of type RSA1, one of type RSA, and one of type DSA. And suppose we want to know the constraint under which we will reach this line marked with success. So clearly, the condition under, under which we will reach this line will be the conjunction of all the conditions under which every call to key new private successfully returns a new key. So therefore, if we take the constraint we had from the previous slide and instantiate it with the correct type and conjoin them, we end up with this rather large constraint here. And if we take into account the fact that this huge constraint arises from this three-line code snippet, then one starts to have doubts about how scalable this approach really is. The solution would be to existentially quantify the constraints that are inside the function, right? The constraint variables. Mm -hmm. So is the problem that uh, you will have ex existential quantification is not decidable or something like that? No, we'll get to it later. Okay. Yeah. So maybe like if you hold that question until the end, I, I can answer it better, I think. So, sorry, you can simplify the formula? You can, you part. can. You can simplify it and get something simpler, but the point remains. That like you get, you end up with large formulas that, that contain lots and lots of redundancies and these variables that you don't want to have in the first place. So I guess going back to your existential quantification question, even if you did existentially quantify all the betas here, you'd still end up with this huge formula that like, and we want to get something much simpler that does and says the same thing. So now what conclusions can we then draw from these examples? First of all, as we saw in the key new private function, these choice variables result in large formulas, which then in turn translates into scalability problems. And furthermore, as we saw in the query user function, when we have recursive constraints that contain choice variables, it's not immediately clear how you can solve those. So therefore, it seems like it might be very desirable to eliminate these annoying choice variables from our constraints. And the first idea that immediately comes to mind is to play the same trick that we always play in program analysis and compute an over-approximation of the constraint not containing any of these choice variables. Now, this discussion brings us immediately to the topic of necessary conditions because an over-approximation of a formula phi not containing any choice variables is a necessary condition of this formula. In other words, it's implied by the original formula. But here, rather than computing any necessary condition, we're specifically interested in computing the strongest necessary condition, if at all possible. And what this formula here says is that the strongest necessary condition, which we denote by the ceiling function, is stronger than any other formula phi prime that, that's also implied by the original constraint and doesn't contain the same set of choice variables. And the, yeah. Is it what do you mean? Like, will such a formula always exist? Uh, it depends on what kind of, what, in what tier you're trying to compute the strongest necessary condition. And for example, in first order logic, computing the strongest necessary condition is undecidable, but in propositional logic, it certainly is. 
it depends on the theory, and we'll talk more about that later. And the reason we like strongest necessary conditions so much is because they have this desirable property of being satisfiability preserving. So in other words, the original constraint phi is satisfiable if and only if its strongest necessary condition is satisfiable. So again, to emphasize here, if we use the strongest necessary condition to determine satisfiability, we're neither over, un over approximating or under approximating. Our answer to satisfiability is, is exact. How did you get that? I mean, one direction is clear, right? Because phi implies ceiling of phi. Yeah. How the other direction, it? one simple way to see it is, for example, if the, cons the original constraint is unsatisfiable, it's equivalent to false, right? And false doesn't contain any choice variables or any set of variables. Uh, the definition that you have for strongest necessary condition does not refer to choice variables in any way. So your explanation doesn't make sense to me. No, it does. What's, what's lacking here is that phi prime doesn't contain the same set of variables as does the strongest necessary condition. Uh, so for example, if beta is a variable that we want to eliminate, then the strongest necessary condition needs to be any other condition that also doesn't contain beta, and that's also implied by the original formula. Same as if in your set phi, you, you quantify phi over all, uh, you, you universally quantify phi over all uh, choice uh, variables? No, they're free. They're free variables. Is the strongest necessary condition semantically equivalent to quantifying out the choice variables? It's essentially quantifying out the choice it variables is. from phi? It is. Okay. So now to be more concrete, let's consider the constraint we had from key new private. So to give you some intuition, here the strongest necessary condition will be just true. And this makes sense because there is no particular requirement that needs to hold about the type of the requested cryptographic key for this function to succeed. In other words, key new private may successfully return a valid key no matter what kind of cryptographic key the programmer requests. Now the second example, let's look at this recursive constraint we had from query user. In this case, the strongest necessary condition is alpha equals true. And again, this makes sense because the only condition that needs to hold is that feature enabled must be true. So if feature enabled is true, query user may return true. That's all we can say. Now, so far, we haven't talked at all about how we can compute these strongest necessary conditions. But even if we did have some way of computing these strongest necessary conditions, our situation would still not be entirely satisfactory. And the reason for that is if we only compute strongest necessary conditions, now we've basically lost our power to soundly negate the constraints. So this is the case because the strongest necessary condition of not phi is not logically equivalent to the negation of the strongest necessary condition of phi. In fact, it turns out that the negation of the strongest necessary condition of phi is not even a necessary condition of not phi, let alone being the strongest one. So therefore, this suggests that we need a dual and complementary notion to strongest necessary conditions, which is weakest sufficient conditions. So now, just like we denoted strongest necessary conditions by the ceiling function, we're going to denote weakest sufficient conditions by the floor function, because they under-approximate the formula. And the weakest sufficient condition will need to satisfy two properties. First of all, it needs to imply the original formula. And second, it needs to be weaker than any other formula phi prime that also implies the original formula, and that doesn't contain the same set of choice variables. So let me guess. This would probably correspond to universal exactly. quantifying. Yeah. So th if there are existing names like universal quantification right. and existential quantification, why do you have to invent new names for those concepts? Because the point we want to eliminate them. We don't want the quantifiers. Very good abstraction. You don't want 
you don't you want to eliminate everything to do with certain types of variables. So the like in the in predicate abstraction, you only want boolean variables left. You don't want any program variables. So so is it equivalent to universally or existentially quantifying this formula? And then eliminating the exactly it is equivalent. Okay. But the point is that we don't want the we don't want the these existential quantified variables because we want to separate out what's key to like as we'll see what's key to path sensitive analysis versus what's noise in the background. So I don't know. That's kind of the intuition. So it's in the sense you could call it eliminating <coughs> elimination of quantity. You could, analysis. yeah. But uh, you have the restriction that there is only one like top level quantification going on. There's no mix. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And just like strongest necessary conditions were satisfiability preserving, unsurprisingly, it turns out that weakest sufficient conditions are validity preserving. So if the, or the original condition phi is valid, if and only if its weakest sufficient condition is also valid. Again, if we use weakest sufficient conditions to determine validity, we're getting an exact answer, not an over or under, or under approximation. Now, again, to give some intuition, let's look at this constraint from Kinu private. Here, the weakest sufficient condition is just alpha is less than or equal to zero, or alpha is greater than or equal to four. And if we think about what this function does, it makes sense because if the type is neither key RSA1, nor key RSA, nor key DSA, then we'll just trivially hit the default case and won't even try to allocate memory. So it will trivially succeed. On the other hand, if we consider the constraint from query user, here the weakest sufficient condition will be just false. And again, this makes sense because there is no condition on feature enabled that will guarantee that query user will return true. It all depends on what the user input is. So therefore, the weakest sufficient condition is false. So now, what have we achieved? So one thing we have achieved is by having pairs of strongest necessary and weakest sufficient conditions, we can now finally make negation work again. And the way we can do it is if we've, if we've computed the strongest necessary and weakest sufficient conditions of phi, then we can compute the strongest necessary condition of not phi by just, negating the weakest, by just negating the weakest sufficient condition of phi. And similarly, we can compute the weakest sufficient condition of not phi by taking the negation of phi's strongest necessary condition. So again, the duality of existential and universal quantifiers comes into play directly here. Now, that was a little bit wordy, so again, let's look at a concrete example. So in the previous examples, we computed the strongest necessary condition for key new private to succeed as true, and the weakest sufficient condition for this function to succeed as alpha is either less than or equal to zero, or alpha is greater than or equal to four. Now suppose I want to know the constraint under which this function will fail. So clearly this is going to be the negation of the constraint under which it will succeed. So now to compute the strongest necessary condition for failure, we take the weakest sufficient condition for success and negate that, which gives us alpha must be between 1 and 3. And to compute the weakest sufficient condition for failure, we'll just negate the strongest necessary condition for success, so that will give us false. And again, it makes sense that the weakest sufficient condition is false because nothing that we know about the type of the cryptographic key will ensure that key new private will fail. And similarly, it's sensible that the uh, strongest necessary condition says alpha must be between 1 and 3 because otherwise if the type is neither key RSA1, key RSA, or key DSA, the function won't even get a chance at failing. Now Tom will actually tell you about how we can go about computing these strongest necessary and weakest sufficient. So what have we done so far? So far we've really only told you how we can identify that special class of variables, which we call choice variables, to model that uncertainty and imprecision in program analysis. 
And we have argued that if we compute pairs of strongest necessary and weakest sufficient conditions that do not contain these choice variables, we can overcome these termination problems that you run into from having these fresh beta substitutions on each recursive invocation. And we can also mitigate some of the scalability problems because we don't have to drag these betas which accumulate everywhere through all constraints in our program. And perhaps most importantly, we can still negate our constraints in a sound way. And actually in a way that's not just sound, but also in a way that preserves satisfiability and validity. However, we haven't really shown you at all how to do any of this. So we've only sort of talked about the general high level overview here. So from now on, let's take a look how we can actually compute the strongest necessary and weakest sufficient conditions for a system of recursive constraints that will represent the exact path and context sensitive conditions under which some property which we're interested in holds. And more specifically, we will use these strongest necessary and weakest sufficient conditions to perform a sound and complete path sensitive program analysis. And our goal here will be to answer may and must queries about the program. And obviously, our completeness guarantee here assumes a user provided finite abstraction. So we are only complete with respect to some finite abstraction of your program. It would obviously be undecidable otherwise. And to sum up uh, the rest of this talk in only three bullet points, we will remove these choice variables from our constraints. We will therefore end up with formulas that we will argue are very small in practice, which in turn will mean that this technique will scale better than existing techniques for doing path and context sensitive program analysis. If you have yeah. Sure. If you have a user provided finite abstraction, then does it mean that your recursive constraints are over uh, the propositional or propositional logic? Actually, if you, if you hold on for like two or three minutes, I'll walk you exactly through the details. And you're, you're getting, you're, you'll see exactly. Your question is right to the point. So before I get started on like exactly what the algorithm is, let me just sort of point out where this approach fits in with existing path and context sensitive analysis. So sort of on the one hand of the spectrum, if you think about the sort of analysis, there are tools that are sort of related or based on model checking ideas. This will be tools such as Bebop, Blast, Slam, and so on. Then sort of on the other side, we have sort of lighter weight static analysis -ish type tools such as maybe Saturn or ESP, which you know sort of try to like do this on a more static analysis way, the same problem. And if you think of the apparent trade-off here, it seems like these sort of static analysis-based tools like Saturn have actually scaled to millions of lines of code, while a tool like Bebop hasn't scaled quite that far on its own. On the other hand, Bebop has this really strong guarantee of being sound and complete, again, obviously, with respect to some finite abstraction, while Saturn and also ESP certainly doesn't have any aspirations to be complete in any sense. So this technique is sort of the idea here is that we want to eliminate this trade-off, and we really want to have a technique that can give the same or very similar guarantees to a technique like Bebop, while still scaling to these really large programs. And so the main contribution here is therefore an algorithm for sound and complete past sensitive analysis that will actually scale to these really large real-world programs. And the key insight we're going to explore here is that while these choice variables are very useful within their scoping boundary, we can safely eliminate them outside their scope as long as we are only interested in an answering may and must queries about the program. So what do I mean by that? Let's be concrete and let's take a look at this uh, process file function here. So process file takes a file pointer f from the user. It then asks the user if the user would like to open a new file. If the user says yes, it says sure I'm going to we assign f to the result of a new f open call. It then calls process file internal with that file pointer f. And if the user chose to actually open a new file, it will go ahead and close that new file before returning to be like a well-behaved function. So as before, the user input here will be represented by a choice variable. And that makes sense since we really can't predict what the user will input again at static analysis time. And note that this function has an interesting feature. It has, more specifically, a branch correlation on that choice variable user input. And if you're, for example, interested in verifying whether the fopen and fclose calls here match up, 
we better have to track this branch correlation. So it's clearly useful within that function. However, since that user input is not visible in the calling context of process file, there's really no additional information we can communicate to the outside from sort of dragging this beta variable along. More specifically, assume we're interested in answering some may and must query about process file, such as may this original file be dereferenced? And let's assume just for the sake of this example that the process file internal here always unconditionally will dereference file f. So now, really the best thing we can say if someone asks us the question is the constraint true. In other words, yes, sure, it may be dereferenced. There's no other information I can tell you that will make your analysis any better if you're a call of process file. Similarly, if you ask me, must that function dereference this file pointer f? Really, the best thing I can say is false, or no, I don't know. It, there's no additional thing I can tell you. It's really not under my control. Uh, just, just so I understand what yeah. you asked me. Uh, the, go back to the previous yeah. one yeah. slide. So that, the main, main slide, one yeah. more. So this, this, the question means, does there exist an input to the function such that if you executed the function on that input, and there's some execution which would lead to the file left being yeah. dereferenced. Exactly. And the must question is, for all inputs and for all paths, do I eventually yes. dereference the file? Exactly. That's exactly. And you get this sort of duality notion, right? Coming in. Of course, if you're interested in, in files, you would be most likely be interested for your program analysis in the may part, right? But you might. You might, you know, you, as we have seen, we'll need the must part to make negations work and so on. So you really always got those sort of as a pair so deal. This, uh, the must business, right? The must business actually requires you to solve the termination problem, right? Yeah, but of course, like, we don't really attempt to reason about non-terminating programs, right? So some of the results are all qualified that, you know, we assume all program paths will terminate. So as usual, yeah. You're absolutely right about that. So now, how are we actually going to go about generating these conditions and solving these problems. Well, first, we will first set up this recursive system of constraints. And we will use the same notation here. We will describe the constraint under which each function, f in our program, will return some abstract value, ci. Yeah. Going back to the question about must, yeah. uh, my suspicion is that the definition of must is with respect to a program location probably. Yeah. And then the question that you're asking is that if you reach this program location, then regardless of what input you reach, then that property must work. So I don't think that there's a... Yeah, so I, I actually don't know. I mean, I don't know the definition of these problems. So I was just conjecturing that, is this the definition of the problem? But the definition that I conjectured has a termination thing built into it. Yeah, my feeling is that yeah. you can also define must without the issue of termination by yeah. saying, if you reach yeah. this program location... I think, I, think you're, I think you're absolutely right about this. The correct way of looking at it is saying, if you get to this program point, then this property must hold. But we're not saying whether you will get there or not. Right? So for all inputs... If you reach this program point, the property P must hold. For all inputs, if there exists a path on that input, to this program point, then uh, this property holds. Yeah. So I see. So there's a for all on the inputs, and there's a there exists on the on the on the path because the function itself could be non-deterministic, right? Yeah. Okay. So now, after we've set up the system of recursive constraints, we will then convert that system to Boolean constraints, and we'll see how to do that. And after we've done that, we will then remove all these choice variables from the Boolean constraints. We will end up with two systems. One of them will be a system describing our necessary conditions, and one will describe our sufficient conditions. And then we will take these systems and twiddle them just a little bit for a few technicalities to make sure that they will actually preserve strongest necessary and weakest sufficient conditions under syntactic substitution. And then we are ready to basically solve them using a standard fixed point computation. So to set up this recursive system E of these initial constraints, we will again use the same notation we've used before here, where we want to express the fact that some function f, given some input alpha, will return some abstract value ci. And for the purposes of this talk, we'll assume that the only thing, the only side effect a function has is its return value. This can easily be extended to like, this not being the case, but it just makes the notation a lot cleaner. And we will end up with this matrix E here, and the phi ij's here are just Boolean constraints. They'll be of the form 
alpha being equal to some value ci, beta being equal to some value ci, return variables pi, and comparisons between two constants. Again, as before, the alphas here will represent the function inputs, and they are obviously provided by the call and context of the function. The betas will represent the choice variables, and the scope of each beta will just be the function body in which it's introduced here. Yeah. An example uh, that uh, was shown earlier on how to generate constraints for a recursive program. It was not clear to me how you are handling loops. Uh, that's a really good question. Actually, we just handle them by treating them as recursive functions. So really, like, I'm only going to talk about recursive functions, and the implementation just turns them into tail recursive code. Right. And uh, unsurprisingly, fits exactly your question, the pies on the right-hand side here, as we've seen, result from the results from function calls. And they have the usual substitutions we discussed. So now let's be specific, and let's look at this very simple function f here. So f takes an integer x, it then declares another int y, calls the user creates the user for some other integer to get user input. If x is 1 or y is 2, it actually returns 1. And otherwise, it returns f of 1. Now, this is actually a really stupid function. If you look at this function for just a second, you will see immediately it's a function that always returns 1, just highly inefficient at doing so. And let's assume for the purposes of our example here that we'll have three abstract values. So more specifically, We'll have the abstract value c1 for the integer 1, c2 for the integer 2, and let's say 3, c3 here stands for all other integers not equal to 1 and 2. And then the constraint we would write would look like this. And here we'll get alpha 1 or beta 2, because for this function to actually return the constant c1, it'll certainly do that if x is equal to 1, alpha equals 1, or beta equals 2. Or the recursive call must return uh, C1, so you have a pi of f alpha C1. And the conditions under which the recursive call holds is exactly the negation of the condition under which you return at this return point marked in red above. So after we have this recursive system of constraints, we now want to convert them to Boolean constraints. And here we are really just going to do the most straightforward thing possible first. So we are going to see expression like ci equals ci, we're going to say true. That wasn't a surprise. If we say ci equals cj, we'll say false. That's also not a surprise. And anything else has to be of the form some variable vi equals cj, and we'll make up some fresh variable vij for that. So for example, if you look at the constraint from function f from just a couple seconds ago, we'll just replace alpha equals 1 by some fresh Boolean variable alpha 1, beta equals 2 by some fresh variable beta 2, and the substitution 1 replaces alpha, unsurprisingly, by true replaces alpha 1, false replaces alpha 2, and false replaces alpha 3. So while this was very simple, it's not quite correct yet. And it's easy to see why it's not correct, because there's no condition that stipulates yet that each of these variables has to have exactly one value at a time. It can't have two values, it can't have zero values, unless we're sort of in a schizophrenic constraint world, and we don't want to be there. And Fortunately, we can very easily enforce these additional constraints. And we can do that just by properly conjoining these existence and uniqueness constraints when we query satisfiability and validity. And if we do that and go back to our three initial abstract values from the beginning, C1, C2, and C3 from the example, we would, for example, conclude that alpha 1 and alpha 2 will be unsatisfiable, because clearly alpha 1 can't be equal to 1 and 2 at the same time. And we would also conclude that beta 1 or beta 2 or beta 3 has to be valid, since if we enumerate all possible abstract values, clearly the resulting constraint is true. So after this step, we're really left with Boolean constraints. And the first thing we're going to recall, we're going to recall that well-known result that states that if you want to compute the strongest necessary condition of some formula phi not containing some choice variable beta, you can do that by you play phi with beta replaced by true, or phi beta replaced by false. And similarly, if you want to compute the weakest sufficient condition, you can do the same thing. You just have to conjoin the two parts of the formula. And this, yeah. You already showed an example where you had an integer variable x. So how did you come up with the finite abstraction? So that's a very good point. For now, we're just going to assume someone gave it to you. So for example, you scanned your program syntactically, every integer you saw you put in your abstract set. 
something like that. Later on in the experiments, I'll elaborate a little bit on what you actually do in practice and how it turns out not to be a very big limitation. But yeah. So this result was actually first given by Mr. George Boole here in the picture in 1892 in a book called On the Laws of Thought. And uh, interestingly enough, this little uh, lemma has been reproved maybe 10 times since then. So there's a whole sequence of papers where someone states this as some sort of lemma. But, and we actually first fell for some of the earlier ones, too. And eventually, we dug our way all the way down to this book. I'm pretty sure it's the first one since it introduces propositional logic in that book. And so if you think back of what this step will actually achieve, so a recursive system has these beta choice variables here. And after we apply Mr. Boole's method, we are then left with two systems, one in necessary condition and one in sufficient condition. And note that there are no more betas in these constraints, which is very good. But of course, they are still recursive, which means it's not quite lunchtime. We still have to <laughs> keep going and actually work through the rest. Right? So now let's see on an example how this actually turns out. So if we go back to a small f function here, and let's say we want to start computing the strongest necessary condition. So as expected, we'll replace beta 2 by true and false, respectively. And we'll put an or between those two parts. So the first part immediately simplifies to true. So we get true or anything. True or anything is anything. So we will end up with, it's actually true, sorry. We will end up with a necessary condition under which this function will return 1 will just be true. Now let's do the same thing for the sufficient condition here. So again, we replace beta 2 by true and false. Now we just conjoin the two parts. First part simplifies to true. True and anything is anything. So now we get the weakest sufficient condition under which this function returns C1. Will it just be alpha 1? Or the recursive call returns C1. So now, to actually solve these recursive constraints, we obviously have to make sure that this constraint must preserve their strongest necessary and weakest sufficient conditions under syntactic substitution. And in their current form, there's two small difficulties that prevent them from having that. And the first reason we've sort of seen earlier already, it's just the fact that the negation of the necessary condition of phi is not equivalent to the negation, to the necessary condition of the negation of phi. And the same thing also holds, obviously, for weakest sufficient conditions. The second problem here arises from the fact that contradictions and tautologies have to be enforced explicitly when we apply these substitutions. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's be concrete and look at this constraint in blue at the bottom of the slide, that pi f alpha c1 and pi f alpha c2. So if you think about what this stands for, it really just says some function at the same call site returns for the same input alpha the abstract value c1 and c2. Clearly, this constraint is false. It can't happen at the same time. So since the strongest necessary condition is expected to preserve satisfiability, the only condition that will preserve the satisfiability of false will again be false. It doesn't have any choice variables, so it's valid. Now, if we assume though that the strongest necessary conditions of f al pi f alpha c1 and pi f alpha c2 on their own are true, which is perfectly possible, then if we just substitute them in, we would get true which is a necessary condition, but certainly not the strongest one. So we have to make sure that this can't happen. We have to, in other words, make sure that for necessary conditions, there's no way that a substitution can accidentally weaken our constraint. So how do we get around these two difficulties? Well, to deal with the first problem, we can either recall, since we are sort of operating with a finite constant assumption, that negation isn't really as bad as it looks, and we can always replace it with some big disjunct. Or we can be much more intelligent, or slightly more intelligent, and use the property that the necessary condition of not phi is equivalent to not the sufficient condition of phi. And the same with the sufficient condition. And obviously, if we want to use this property, it will require us to simultaneously fix points strongest necessary and weakest sufficient conditions. But it's really important for a practical implementation. So how can we deal with these contradictions and tautologies? Well, if we're concerned about strongest necessary conditions, one very easy way of making sure there's no way that a substitution can actually weaken our constraint is to convert that constraint to a disjunctive normal form and drop all contradictions, which have to be of a very special syntactic form at this stage, so we can find them really easily. And again, for weakest sufficient conditions, things are pretty much the same, just upside down. So here, 
what really gets us into trouble is tautologies. You want to make sure they can't inadvertently be strengthened in a substitution. And we prevent that by converting to conjunctive normal form and dropping all tautologies from them. So after we've done that, the resulting constraints will now preserve strongest necessary and weakest sufficient conditions just under a simple syntactic substitution. So we'll go ahead, we'll throw them in our fixed point computation, we wait, and out comes a system with non-recursive constraints not containing any choice variables, which we can use for May and Mass queries. And let's go back to the F example and its original constraint here. Remember that we computed the strongest necessary condition for this function to return C1 is true. Well, great, we're done. It's not recursive. There's nothing left to solve. The weakest sufficient condition is still recursive. So let's say here we want to compute the greatest fixed point. So we get alpha 1 or false equals alpha 1. Alpha 1 or alpha 1, where true replaces alpha 1, will give us alpha 1 or true, and we'll have fixed point at true. And note that this efficient expression, the efficient condition here expresses exactly that this function must return true, must always return 1, because it's valid. So you can see how, the, how this technique was able to deduce that this function f is really not a very intelligent function. It's a function that must return 1. So the main result so far is therefore a technique that's sound and complete for answering these may and must queries, again with respect to some finite abstraction, of course. And the claim here is that by eliminating these choice variables, we will end up with much smaller formulas in practice, which in turn will mean that we can scale quite, quite a bit better than existing approaches to similar problems. And now, of course, I'm going to back up this claim that this actually, these conditions actually stay small and this actually scales. We decided to do some experiments and see what things look like in practice, because they often look very different than you think they do. And uh, for that, we decided to compute the full interprocedural constraint for every single point of the reference in OpenSSH, SAMBA, and the entire Linux kernel. And of course, if I say full constraint, we're going to compute what we showed you in the talk. So we're going to compute necessary and sufficient conditions. Now, we believe that this is a stress test for this technique, since we couldn't really think of anything that's more ubiquitous in C than a point of the reference. So we therefore hope that if this, if this technique scales to point of the references, it should also scale to many other properties that it might be interested in. What does this mean? To compute a constraint for every point of the reference? So, so our goal here is basically to say, for each function, what's the constraint under which you will dereference your argument? Or one of your arguments, or one of the fields of your arguments, and so on. So for example, you might ask, what's the constraint under which you dereference your first argument's F field? And you know, obviously, this might be potentially be recursive. It's like interprocedural because you might make calls. So that's the question we're asking. So for every function and for every argument, you compute a separate yes. constraint. Yeah. And if you look at the graph here, so this graph shows on the x-axis the size of these necessary and sufficient conditions, where necessary conditions are marked in red, and sufficient conditions are marked in green. And on the y-axis, it shows the frequency. And this graph is on Linux because it's just the largest, so it gives the best sample size. But they're very similar. There's no significant difference. And one thing to note that the y-axis here is actually on a log scale. <laughs> so if you look at this closely, you can see that more than 99% of all of these constraints have less than 9 Boolean connectors in them. So they're really, really small. And it's exactly the main, the main point here that allows this technique to scale to something like Linux because it can separate out sort of the wheat from the chaff and pass sensitivity. So it doesn't have to worry about these huge constraints that accumulate. The things it ends up with in practice are very small. And again, this is really this graph gives the, gives the whole explanation why this ever ran on Linux. So what's your finite abstraction? That's a very good question. So the finite abstraction we used, so as I've seen, as, we've, as, I've, as we have said in this talk, for this technique to be complete, obviously it's with respect to that finite abstraction. But you can still be sound and almost be complete if you just you know, use some sort of potentially not finite abstraction. So for example, you take all the indices that syntactically appear in your program and all the things you compare to and stuff like that. So we use some technique like that to generate a set of things we track. And that's the things we, that's, you know, that's basically the conditions we, we get from the program. And modulo sort of, unless you start, start computing arithmetic, so you're returning twice your input, this technique like still is complete. Yeah. So, so going back to sort of the point of the debug, I mean, if you have like mm, nine Boolean variables per procedure, 
bebops can, can scale to Linux, no problem. The thing that doesn't be, be, make bebop scale is the refinement loop yeah. in Slam, right? Where you start generating, you know, really big BDDs. So, so fundamentally, like, I'm, I'm still trying to, so, so fundamentally, if I have a fixed finite abstraction, what bebop does is it computes post iteratively, uh, and it uses Boole's law when it computes uh, procedure summaries, all the local variables of a procedure get existentially quantified out, just like you, just like you show there. Uh, and then it's a post, so the image under post also has existential quantification. And so, BDDs uses BDDs to do all that. Yeah, right? yeah, but it's using BDDs yeah. to suck it up. Um, so I'm just trying to think. But, so, so there's so what what so it's not doing I, is it's not doing. It's not, but it's not doing this dual uh, thing. I mean, so in so your in your case, he, they are doing existential quantification by massaging formulas, right? My question so is, is supposing so you just map everything down to BDDs, then no, 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 how no, no, would that can compare? I, can I finish my question? Yeah. So, so, so when I'm doing post, I'm doing strongest computation. So I'm doing all this existential. Everything's existential. So what is the universal binding? I don't. But so, so basically, I have a transition yeah. system, and I do an image computation, and I existentially quantify out the intermediate state. And when I lift a summary to a caller, I existentially quantify at the locals. So, yeah. so I just want to understand, if, if I understand sort of what you've done in the context of bebop, then you have an extra step, which is this must. And I want, really want to try to understand what is the must buying you. Because yeah. that's something that bebop doesn't do. But we could also do the universal thing, because I can yeah. also do your rule. And I'm not quite sure. So the main, the main thing, this must thing buys you. Assume, first of all, if you're interested in must properties, obviously it's important. Let's assume we're interested in may properties. Yeah, yeah. So if you're interested in may properties, what it really buys you is that you can do a negation easily. And you can do the negation without explicitly enumerating this disjunction of abstract values, which might be huge. Like, for example, in Linux, it might be like hundreds of thousands of elements. It might be more. Not in one function, but overall. So if I want to like, take every integer someone compared to in any place of the program, I mean, I can write the disjunct this, this, this disjunction in theory, but I can basically go home after I wrote it. Right. But, but think about the following, right? In BDDs, a function and its negation have the same representation complexity. If you represent the function using BDDs. So you're saying it would be possible to encode something similar efficiently in BDDs as well? Well, I don't know. I haven't thought about yeah. the problem, but this problem that you well, just I have alluded to. I mean, I have negation. I mean, essentially, essentially every Boolean variable, I also have its negation, right? Yeah. So, 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 I don't know. so maybe we should take it offline. But, but that, as you want to negate without without the sense of the quantifier. Exactly, because what you're going to do, you're going to turn it existential into universal. It's not quite the semantics you want, right? Because if I say there exists some beta that's equal to y. I don't say the negation of this doesn't mean that for all, you know, like they're really just free variables in my constraint. That's how I want the negation to work out from what it's supposed to mean. But basically what you're, what you're saying is that if I have a may query and I want to negate it, then I can use some must information, yeah. right, to refine yeah. that. And that, that can cut off a lot of search potentially. Yeah. And note that in this, in this technique, there's no refinement loop, right? No, 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 so we... No, I understand. Yeah. But I th yeah, I think that's, that's a good way of... I think an example you could make is, so you're computing main information for a procedure. This procedure calls another procedure and returns a value, and you compare that return value. And uh, you can say things, like if that other procedure, if you know it... it must if you have always. must information, you can use that to give main information about the computing. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. And, and then you I, I really haven't understood how they interact in this framework. So, so don't we have now know the answer to your question, or are you still present? Because I also had a similar question as you had. My understanding is that the existential quantification is useful for summarizing procedures for computing must information, and universal quantification is useful for summarizing procedures for main information. Yes. But I don't understand the interaction between I mean, the interaction really comes from the fact that if you have some may fact and you negate it, it becomes a must fact. 
And similarly, if you have a must fact and you negate it, it becomes a may fact. When, when do you negate it? Oh, so, so whenever, you don't know, right? So I'm computing summary for myself, right? I'm computing, let's say, the constraint under which I return the integer one. So now, I do not know. Some of my calling contexts may right. be asking, am I equal to two? Others will right. say, am I greater than one? So there will be some sort of negation in there. And if they're in the, basically what this technique gives you, that I look at this procedure once and I just compute both. I'm going to say whatever you want. You, if you use my return value in a negation, I'm ready. If you don't use it in a negation, fine with me. I have a formula for both. So sort of by doing this both, sort of negation really just, you know, you can just naturally pick the, uh, the sufficient condition, flip it up. And that's what you take. That's sort of the main, yeah. But is it not the case that to compute must information, you need must information at each step, yes. and vice versa? Oh, There's yes. No yeah. So now we, we, they do interact at the negation points, right? Yeah. So like basically, like every, like from an, you know, to be really concrete, right? In the system, we implemented this. Like if you talk about a constraint, it's a pair, right? It's a MAPE and it's like a necessary and a sufficient conditions everywhere. So that's exactly the way this works out, yeah? So it is everywhere in that but sense. You, you find that you, so, but you do get a lot of must information? You surprisingly do. Uh, Not always, but you do, because there's a lot right, of- Because generally, I mean, my, in my experimentation with must, yes. which has been very small compared to what you've done, there's, for predicate abstraction, there's very often, there's very often, it's hard to get must, right? Generally, generally you need a lot more information because must is an under approximation. Yeah. And so generally you need a lot more predicates to get must. And, and you just, but, I mean, but dep it depends on your abstraction. I mean, so for example, one way we needed this must information is suppose like we're doing pointer analysis, right? And some co coli has some side effect that, and I computed like some, the conditions under yeah. which it may and must happen. Now, too, and the, in the calling context, it had some other targets pr prior to calling this function, right? Now, to determine the constraint under which it will still point to its old targets, I have to use the must information from the Kali and negate that yes. so that it stays like, you, you see what I'm saying? So, I mean, for example, if I want to make, if I want to write an analysis that verifies that variables are initialized, let's say, and I pass a variable to an init variable function. In this case, I'm really interested in must, right? Must is where it will be initialized. So that's and sort of that's, that's the constraint under which I can keep my old targets in the points to sets. That's where must comes everywhere in sort of the memory graph. I, I have a question yeah. about must and may. I find this whole terminology very confusing. Can I think of must query as an assertion somewhere in the program? As an assertion that can never fail. That's yeah, and you're asking, yeah. you're asking, is it true that this assertion never fails? Yeah. It's a decision problem yeah. when you're asking, is it true that this assertion never fails? Yeah. And a may query can also be captured by an assertion, but in this case you're asking the reverse question. Is it false that this assertion never fails? Yeah. I think that's one way. It's this, like this NP co NP duality, yeah. right? Yeah. So then what I don't understand is that supposing I'm only interested in proving assertions in programs. Right? That I'm only yeah. insert in, interested in must queries. Mm -hmm. No, I think uh, must like, is equal to an assertion. May is not equal to an assertion. So a may query is not right in assertion at all. So what can give me an example of may query? So for make example, may this point a the reference. So you want to know in this function I pass in now, is it safe, right? So you want to say may someone dereference that. So if I tell you that you know x may point to y and x may point to z, what I'm really telling you is that x does not point to u, x does not point to v. No, no, no. Can we do the following? Actually, maybe you should finish your talk. Okay. <laughs> Let me because finish. I would like to understand may and must yeah. in the yeah. case of straight line programs manipulating only Boolean variables. Definitely. That way we can get away from all this pointer business. Yeah. No, but I think if I, I have a feeling like the fact that you're not only looking at Boolean values is important here. Ah, okay. So then I would like to understand that first. Yeah. All right. We'll definitely do that. Let me just... So, you have shown the graph, you've seen that they stay very small. And I mean, this again, the app sort of the, as you pointed out correctly, obviously with respect to what abstraction, the, respect, the abstraction here is very fine grained. So we allow anything, any constant you compare to any constant that flows around. So, you know, there's a potentially, if you would total them out, there would be hundreds of thousands of abstract values easily on something like Linux. So now, I mean, that's all nice and good. And I've shown you like a graph and they stay small and so on and they're green and red, but like, Maybe more interesting is the question, how useful is this actually for like a real program analysis problem? So to see whether there's any real use from being fully path and context sensitive, we decided to try a little null dereference analysis using these techniques. 
And to be able to compare what difference this particular technique makes, we implemented sort of two versions of this. And on the left-hand side, you see the number for a fully pass-sensitive analysis that computes exactly the strongest necessary and weakest sufficient conditions. And on the right-hand side, you see an analysis that's only intra-procedurally pass-sensitive. So it drops all constraints at procedure boundaries and just says true or false, depending on whether it's satisfiable or not. And if you look at the report to bug ratio here, for example, again, it's on the Linux, it's on the same three applications, SSH, Samba, and the Linux kernel, you can see that we were able to get close to an order of magnitude reduction in the false positives. And we did that without resorting to any sort of, you know, usual tricks like find a few values that may be important for null or this sort of stuff. Just sort of use this general technique and plug it right in. So one caveat, the numbers I've shown you on that previous slide do not track any null values that flow into unbounded data structures, such as arrays and linked lists. And the reason for that is very simple and really orthogonal. It's just that the underlying framework which we use to implement this prototype doesn't track any unbounded data structures. It just makes one big summary blob and everything goes in there. And we found that to be in a, unacceptably imprecise for verifying memory safety. So for that part, this technique isn't, it's really, it's really an orthogonal issue we're trying to attack here from shape analysis. And actually the analysis of uh, contents of these position dependent data structures, such as arrays, linked lists, and so on, is actually one of our current projects and it grew exactly out of the limitations of this, uh, this pre previous prototype. Now, a second question that you might ask that's very interesting perhaps, is we've really only shown you how to compute those things in the weakest possible of all theories, namely propositional logic. So what about doing that in richer theories? And it, for example, we might be interested in computing necessary and sufficient conditions for the theory of uninterpreted functions, or the combined theory of linear integer arithmetic and uninterpreted functions, and so on. And it turns out that many of the issues here are very closely related to this idea of cover algorithms for existential quantifier elimination. And really you can see a cover algorithm as computing a necessary condition for a not recursive constraint. So as far as related work is concerned, I'll keep it brief since we're a little late. Uh, I've already sort of talked about previous path and context sensitive analysis. Now, just a couple of remarks on this idea of over and under approximation. So this idea certainly has been around for a while, both in model checking and abstract interpretation. Probably the most related work to this particular work is Dave Schmidt's work on over and under approximation in abstract interpretation. So one of the main differences here is that we're not just interested in any over and under approximation, but in one that actually preserves satisfiability and validity. And if we give a specific algorithm for a specific domain for doing that. Another difference is that we also sort of really want to handle these negations in a fundamental way by having these pairs of constraints which flip. We really don't want to start enumerating things since we need to, you know, we, don't, we can't really make these sort of monotonicity assumptions like absolute interpretation can, at least not without really ruining our scalability of the approach. All right, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> you can discuss. Uh, you can discuss now. You can discuss now, but uh, but maybe we should just let them uh, let them take their microphones off. You know, okay. To, yeah. All right, thank you.